go. All right. Well, Nicole, it's so good to have you on the show. Hello. Full disclosure, it was my uh, my lovely partner who was sitting just opposite me who actually got me onto you. And um, we um, we we love the holistic stuff, but we also love the marketing stuff as well. And there's like a real authentic journey that you see shine through um, when you're uploading and when you're talking about the stuff. And I think it's so good to see that side, especially in psychology as well, because, you know, historically there's been that real kind of detachment from who a psychologist is apart from what they do, you know? So what was the, what was the moment for you where you kind of was just like, you know what, I'm actually just going to pump this marketing thing. And cause I just looked recently and there was about six months and yeah, it was a bit of a milestone. Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, thank you, lovely partner back there. Yes. Hello. For sharing my work. It's very awesome. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think I want to just quickly, so part of, I think, the reason why, especially in psychology, to speak to your point, mm. people maybe aren't sharing, sharing personal details. Definitely, I think social media is this whole gray area for everyone kind of in, in the field because I think to a large extent, a lot of us were trained actually not to do that. Mm. Um, that there's a lot of psychology training, at least in the traditional model, whereas, I mean, even as directly as no disclosure, don't be a person in the room. Maybe yeah. you've heard of this idea of the blind slate model. Mm. Um, so I think, I say that because I do think a lot of clinicians um, operate like that in the rooms. And now I see that translating largely into social media yep. with even questions from like, especially some of the older term clinicians about how to even use that. Is it appropriate to be on there? Okay. And if I've made a decision to be on there, yeah. what is appropriate to share and not, and not to share? Yes. Um, so I've always been, I, I always kind of joke, I've always been kind of like in my own lane uh, in terms of the clinical work I've done. And I've always been a very full disclosure person. So I've always been someone who is comfortable being a human in the room and have, has always operated that way clinically. Um, and then obviously I started to watch social media expand and the world and the <clears> connections <throat> that could be made on there. Mm. And it felt like that was a natural next step, especially when I was evolving my message and really wanting to, I think, get, get some of this information out there on the more global scale. So, you know, social media to me was a huge, was a huge untapped resource. And like I said, being comfortable with sharing my own parts of the journey. I thought that that would add not only a cool, you know, a different perspective on kind of who a psychologist is as a person, um, but I, you know, I will often write a lot. I actually just wrote a post this morning, sharing my own struggles and healing too, you know, having and walking alongside of, you know, the self healer movement that I'm, you know, trying to, you know, very much a part of at this point. I, I think it's important to also share the difficult aspects of the journey too. So that just became again, another, another why not you know if i can be mm. human and can show people that this isn't easy um let me let me show people the whole of the experience and not just be someone who's saying do this or don't do that let me show what it looks like to do it right alongside of them and to struggle in ways that i know a lot of people struggle yes yeah and i mean <clears throat> you say it in such a way you, you can see both sides because one um you know the the trying to be a almost fly on the wall concept is it it, it has its benefit because you you can you know, as, as human beings, we're so easily influenced by the other person that, you know, a, a client could say something and then, you know, you're triggered or, or things are all happening as well. So you see both sides, but I think um, more to your point, especially with what you're doing now, it is so good to see someone who practices what they preach. And it's, it's like, Hey, look, we are all in the struggle together to use that word. Life can also be a bloody blessing. This is my area this is why this works because I've tried this other thing and that made me feel terrible. So I'm telling you anecdotally, this is why. And then this is also the science as well. I think it's fantastic, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. I think so it becomes navigating the difference, like you were saying, between being able to be objective, right, in the room where if I am being triggered, I can leave that out but also being the humanity and being, you know, bringing in the relatable part. So I think it's navigating that fine space. Yeah, for sure. And you got to have a fun time while you're doing it as well. Social media is fun. Look what we're doing. <laughs> I know. It's very cool. I mean, I, I am just still blown away by, you know, kind of the community. And I say this too, I can't take all of the credit because I think a huge part is just people's readiness. Like mm. I'm putting a message out there. And at this point, I mean, Jesus, 60,000 people are ready to hear that. And, you know, I think it's just so emblematic of the greater shift in consciousness that's mm. happening. And, you know, it isn't me. And again, I think people are yearning for community and connection because 
sometimes I think part of the process can be very lonely and isolating. Mm. We have to shift a lot of relationships where maybe existing in the world in a much different way than some of our peers are. So I think it's beautiful to be able to have the connections that, yeah, they might not be in your, in your neighborhood, in your town, in your city, but they can still be really, really valuable. So I just think the community aspect of social media can be incredibly helpful. Mm, Absolutely. Yep. Um, so I wanted to ask, you came through and you studied and you went through that way. Um, and then now you've kind of made a bit of an adjustment to more of the holistic approach. On that new front, what's been the most um, well-received um, tool, I guess, you know, because you've got your breath work and even diet is such a big one as well. But I guess where do people see the biggest shift from that new holistic approach? I think that, you know, I think, I mean, <clears throat> mindfulness, I can kind of back it up too. I think mindfulness has always been a part of my practice before yeah. I would kind of have to, I had two pivots in my own personal life and personal training or clinical training. Mm-hmm. One was discovering <clears throat> mindfulness has happened well before mindfulness, I think is what it is now. Mm. Um, and then the next pivot was kind of my health and realizing that the body had to be included. Um, I think mindfulness has always been there in my world and it's definitely part of the, the, the holistic approach that I now utilize. I think that's the most, that's kind of the universally known aspect of it. Yeah. Now. Anyone who practices yoga or med- you, you, at this point you've heard of mindfulness and meditation. Yeah. Um, so I think that's been a, a really naturally kind of um, integrated part into, you know, of my message that most people can identify with, have heard of, or relate to maybe even, Right. Yeah. It, obviously, it's in barriers that people get tricked up around with all things mindfulness and meditation. But I think that was that's the first kind of eased way in because it's natural. It's there. Like, yes. It's yeah. It. Um, <clears throat> breath work, I think, is an extension of that. Right. So, like here, let me show you that you have more control. Let me show mm. you that you can control your body. This is where we're actually making that connect between intention or the mind and choices and, and our body's physiology. Um, I guess I would put all things nutrition and third on the list because I think that there's a lot of overwhelming contradicting opposing information out there on terms of nutri- all things nutrition yeah <laughs> that I had to sift through myself in terms of my own self-healing process so I get it yeah um and I, I think <clears throat> that is we're not taught this Anywhere in school, there's not a clinician, um, and I don't think programs have changed to that extent as of recent. I'm hoping that does happen, and I hope to play a part of it. For sure. But we're not learning this. Mm. Um, so I think that that is a, a, a fear base, a threat point, and an overwhelm, like I was saying earlier, mm. for a lot of not only the clinicians, but I think the individuals, the people who want to heal. I think that there's a lot that gets wrapped up in how much role does nutrition play or doesn't it? And if I do think it plays a role, what is the right diet for me? And I think that actually, I would say, is not the easiest sell in a sense. Um, but it's, in my opinion, one of the most foundational and important ones. Yeah, for sure. Yep. It certainly, it certainly sets everything else in tone as well. It's so funny though, when you have, um, when you are going through like a mental health issue and speaking from experience, you know, taking myself back to that moment, nutrition was like the last thing I was thinking of, you know, I was really worried about the, all these intrusive thoughts and worried about the compulsions I was doing and stuff. And the last thing I was thinking was like, Oh yeah, that's right. I ate like 79 chicken burgers last night. It's probably not the best thing, you know? Right. Right. Yeah. I I agree with you. And I think it's, it's not only the not intuitive thing that we go to first, Um, I think that there's a lot of feelings and beliefs that get wrapped up around in terms of resistance. Mm. Um, I think eating and food is so much beyond nutritional needs that my body has and what I'm putting in. We have meaning, psychological, emotional that get wrapped up in our, in our eating behaviors. Mm. I think I did a post recently about accountability. I think that there's, it's it's much more complicated. And like you're saying, it isn't the first thought of thing, but it's also the most consistent thing that we do have control over that I do think, like I said, has a lot of barriers to us taking the control and making the better choices for ourselves. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so where does uh, does breath work come into this? Because uh, I'm a little bit biased because Siobhan here is um, really excited about moving into that area. So um, I was nudged to ask that question. <laughs> but um, yeah, how does, it, how does it come into your practice and um, I guess if you could sp- explain to the listeners kind of what the benefits of breath work are, because it's um, it's very uncommon to people. It's not a, it's like it's not a household known, I guess. 
Yeah. No, absolutely not. I mean, it's the funniest thing, right? We all breathe every day to stay alive. Well, I don't, we're but not taught to breathe. <laughs> yeah, well, you are special. We're we're not taught to breathe, and we don't understand. I think the power of the breath, really. Um, I think naturally, as a culture, even as a species, really. Although there are some cultures out there that I do think value breath more so. Um, but it's incredibly important because, like I said, it's the bridge between our mind, our conscious mind, our thinking, our choices, yep. and our physiology. I mean, we can literally directly affect our body's physiology down to stress hormone level with the power of the choice and the engagement in breath work. Mm. Um, but I think it's hugely incredibly important. The call that I got off of right before our call today was all, all about breath work, all about the reality. So we have to simplify it. We have two nervous systems in our body. One, your listeners might have heard called the fight or flight. It's the sympathetic nervous system. And then we have the parasympathetic or the rest and digest nervous system. Yep. The way they work is they're like the brake and the gas in the car, meaning when one is activated, one is deactivated. The issue has become now for humans, so our resting state as a human should be, should be, be that we are in parasympathetic, we are in rest and digest all of the time until there's a very real threat that then we shift over into fight or flight. We literally fight or run away. We save ourselves. This is obviously very generally based. We save ourselves. We have all the stress hormone running through us. Our muscles are primed for action. We're not digesting our food. We're doing all this good stuff to keep us alive. Yep. And then we go back down to, to rest and digest, right? The reality of it is, Threat has taken on a whole new level for us as humans, even though we're not on the tundra anymore, right? Emotions are threats, environments are threats, city life is a threat, mm. um, and our mind doesn't know the difference between what's real, the tiger in the jungle, or what we're just imagining to be real. Mm. So most of us as humans are spending well, way too much time, if not all of our time, in that fight or flight nervous system, which mm. has so many, you know, kind of difficult. Uh, effect from you know being wired and tired having brain fog not being able to eat eating too much not being able to sleep sleeping too much right as all these negative effects i think that we can be hyperactive hyper reactive that we carry so breath work is a great tool that we should use consistently to start to reactivate that rest and digest system so that we're spending more time balanced yeah yeah and it's also there's also a bit of knowledge in it as well which is there's that little bit of break between someone who's the expert and someone who isn't because i know coming from a crossfit background that what a lot of people do to you know calm down from all the stresses in everyday life is go and do an intense workout which more often than not kind of spikes the uh, the fight or flight even more because there's so many physiological stresses as you know yeah absolutely i think that that's a, a huge a huge part of it too and, and a lot of times it's been a shift, I think, in terms of what exercise is, in terms of its benefits, what types, I should say, are beneficial. And while, yes, bursts of activity and strength and hit type models, crossfit type models are absolutely helpful, and they have a lot of great physiological benefits as well. Yeah. But you're right, I think that we can even err on the side of being over-reliant or doing too much of that, where, again, we're chronically stressing our body in a way that if we don't build in these more balanced moments, we're going to just continue to have those scales hit. Yeah, yeah. I've also, I've got a, this is an area that I've been deeply fascinated with um, over the past quarter, six to eight months. It's the um, existential, I guess, suffering, if you want to call it that, that we're kind of seeing in the 21st century. And I wanted to um, kind of open that discussion a little bit and kind of where you see a lot of people coming to you, where their suffering arises from. Is it that, that, you know, we have all these availabilities now that everything seems to be a little bit meaningless and that's when the neuroses, you know, begin to manifest. And yeah, if you could just explain and talk a little bit about that, I'd be bloody interested. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'm going to actually take it a step back beyond before yeah. what we have or don't have in our external and say that in my opinion, at least most of the existential crises I see and work with pretty much on every, within every human has some version of it. Mm. It's actually a disconnect from the self. Yeah. It, it actually starts inward, right? Which then results in it looking outward for these things, mm. which might feel meaningless. But my argument is always, it's because it's really reflective of our relationship or lack of relationship or complete disconnection and or, you know, kind of subversion. Because I, I know I really want to do this, but I'm doing this. And again, there's a million other iterations of that from the self. 
Yeah. I think it originates at that deeper space. Again, for many different reasons, many different pathways that we come by it. But I think every human in some, some way is disconnected from themselves and or meeting their own needs, you know, and or knowing what their passion is and what path that they need to be on. That then and does look a looking outward and it can translate to like it's too much or it's too immediate or it's not enough or it's meaningless or it's empty but like I said I think it really originates in, in what we feel or don't feel about ourselves first and I think every I think it's a shared a universality I think that most everyone I work with has to do that deeper level self work yeah. as part of their journey it's the longer term work but it's, it's, it's integral yes absolutely and you actually see that in the rise too with um, again like we spoke about the um, you know the, the rise in the extremes because people are so far on the opposite side of things. So like just the idea of CrossFit, I'm not having a go at it because I'm actually a CrossFit coach myself, <laughs> but um, probably not for long after this podcast. But <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know you see that where people are just so stressed and or anxious and depressed on one side, so they beat themselves up on this other side. And you actually see that um, with consciousness itself. You see people heading down to Peru to just really get involved with ayahuasca and you're trying to take lots and lots of psychedelics. But I guess it comes from, I need to get myself fixed. I need to, so I'm going to take this, which is actually the same as doing nothing as well, because there's no work involved with that mindset. Mm-hmm. I think it's looking for, like I said, the external right thing outside mm. while the ayahuasca and again, plant medicine, I, I don't think, I think that it can have, have some therapeutic value. For sure. Connecting one to the cell, removing blocks and like that. But I think, again, it's still utilizing the thing outside of me right, mm. to access that, which again, while it could afford you a pivotal shift in consciousness that then translates to that internal work, for sure, right? But I also think it, it, it kind of uh, orbits around another concept that I see a lot of in my traditional work and in my holistic work, which is the desire, right, for it to be a, 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 a one problem and a one solution, yeah. you know, kind of a reductionistic, I call it, approach, right? So not only am I looking for something outside of me, but there's like a broken thing that if I take this retreat or I take this plant medicine, yeah. or I go even therapy functions at that, right? I go see this person who can give me the thing. And I think, again, I'm so much more involving my, my work in terms of so much more understanding the whole, the integral, the multiple parts, that there's not one thing, right? There's many interactions of things. And then therefore what healing, health, mental wellness looks like is going to be a combination of many things, not a one thing. So I think that touches on that too, right? This idea that I'm feeling empty, so I'm gonna go on this journey, one thing, do this one you know, ayahuasca experience, and now I'm fixed. And I just don't think that that's the reality. <laughs> yeah, and look, I mean, akin to your work i would i would even argue that it's the only way to do it because number one as human beings we're always going to have something that needs fixing we're never going to be perfect but if you can find something in life that kind of makes that almost enjoyable or worthwhile then you kind of accept everything else that it comes from that you know it makes it a bit more yeah meaningful Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah, I completely, I completely agree, mm. and I think that that part of it is, you know, to throw out like, resilience, right? mm. developing a resilience <clears> as a being, a physical resilience in our bodies, an emotional resilience, a psychological resilience. Because you're right, right? The, the saying that I'm sure a lot of us have heard: wherever you go, there you are. Right? Life happens. There's no tops of the mountain. You know? Yeah. But you're right. That we need, we need to have the something that allows us to 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 cope. And I think that again, for many different reasons, most of us as an adult are not equipped with that. Um, so part of the journey is finding that within ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. So what would you, what would you recommend to someone that's, I guess, open to this idea of um, holistic well being, and, you know, they want to start with themselves. Like what's, what's something that someone could do just to take that initial step? Yeah. I mean, I think uh, acknowledging that, you are playing a role as the hugest, you know, kind of yeah. psychological <clears throat> Love that. right? Accountability, right? Acknowledging that, you know, we're, we, we've played a role, whether we like to admit it or not, mm. you know, again, some of it has to do with, you know, accumulation of past experiences, you know, but again, we are actively playing a role in our daily life yeah. and therefore taking some version of an accountability. So, okay. Cause the, the flip side of that, as difficult as that is to, and I actually wrote a post that I would say, I, I did not like that. I did not like to have to take responsibility. I yeah. came from a, a long line of, of 
external externalizers and yeah. you know, kind of blaming and things outside of myself resulted in you know my fortune or misfortune to be honest mm. right so overcoming mm. that mindset was was very hard for me um but i think on the other side of that as difficult as it, as it is which is why i share <clears> that it's hard i think to acknowledge that we're playing a role and that we need to take responsibility even in our wellness again i don't believe that there's a gene that i have or don't have and that results in my physical or mental unwellness right that I control, I just was on the other side of that. I have control. That's hugely empowering, obviously. Once you get over the hump of difficulty, okay, well, then that means that I can now make different choices and create a different life for myself. So mm. I think that's the most, before we even talk practical steps, I think that's the most important psychological first step. Yeah. And in some ways, it's, um, it is the most practical step to, to, to look at yourself in the mirror and accept responsibility for everything is, is bloody tough because even like you said, the fortune or the misfortune, there's a lot of things that have happened to people um, and they're not responsible for them. And they it's just pure unluck or someone has been extremely malevolent or what, whatever it is, but it's hard to accept responsibility for something like that. But when when you do, you can you can shift that mindset and, and recognize that when you take on responsibility, as, as rough as that sounds, it's also very liberating because now it's your life and you can go and walk the road that you it's designed for you or that, or that you truly want to do. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, I mean, <clears throat> so to speak to your point, yes, things can happen to us that are largely out of our control, mm. but what we do with them and about them and from them is where our control lie. And I think yes. that's, that's the shift in the reframe because like I'm never going to have, you know, say that, you know, some, some terrible trauma or calamity that happened to someone was brought on by them. You know, I'm not implicating that at yeah. all, but I'm saying, okay, well, that happened, mm. right? As terrible as that is, and now what? Mm. And then that's like the point is, okay, now I can assume the responsibility for what happens next. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So what about yourself then? So what's... um. What's a what's your kind of go to? What's your thing that um, that you really use as a tool? Some people have diary writing. Some people some people do really love meditating, and that just truly works for them. And that's probably the one for me and Siobhan. But yeah, what's yours? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think I do a, a combination of things, but I think the the underlying biggest thing is is being consciously aware, being mm. mindful, being present. Um, I carry that with me, you know, on other days when throughout my day yeah. uh, because that's where our, that's where our choice and empowerment is and you know so whenever I talk about the subconscious work that I'm always going on and on about stories being unconscious to our day is where we start to go down those negative patterns those, those negative pathways yeah. that give us the same result so I think that's the most critical kind of thing that I'm always working to, de to, to hone to develop to strengthen so it looks like not only I I do a simplification practice. I do one every morning. So it looks like not only carving out time to sit with my thoughts, distance myself from my thoughts, observe my thoughts, let my thoughts go, yep. but being mindfully present in my day too, because that's helpful. And that can actually, that can carry me and balance me. But what ha happens when I become triggered during my day? Can I step back from my thoughts? Can I choose a different response? Mm. And I think that's the most critical skill. So like I said, while I'm off for, and every time I work with someone, I do talk about, having a meditation practice, you know, that looks like sitting in a room, like when we think of traditional meditation, I think the evolution at some point needs to be being mindfully present to our current environment, to our current choices, because that's where choice is. That's yeah. us being in that frontal lobe part of our brain that makes us human <clears throat> and not running on those old programs that, again, it's going to get us more of the same. Yes, exactly. It's so, you, you're spot on. You're spot on because it's, it's all well and good having a, a brilliant meditation practice where you went off and you went deep into the subconscious and had all this emotional healing. But how how enlightened are you when your boss is screaming in your ear, or you know when someone's late to 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 one of your appointments or something like that? That's that's the real world practical uh, application of meditation, really, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And I always bring up the steps for change or healing our work and one of them is awareness and yep. you know, developing like you said through this great meditation practice being able to look at all our stories and understand them yeah. and connect them back to our path and back <laughs> to this great future right but then there's and then there's action okay, yeah well now what right if you're only if that's only going to be contained in that meditative world again while that's well and great and we can get really good at that you're right what when are we different now in the world mm. to start getting different results and i think those are the 
a lot of times we become stuck along the way at different junctures, but those are the two major junctures. Yeah. And again, I relate to this on a personal level. Personal level, I have always been someone who you know has considered myself self aware. Mm. You know, I like I said, I discovered mindfulness very early. You know, I kind of like got it, but yet I was still doing all of those same net negative patterns because it was just so hard for me to translate that into life and when I was triggered. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And so could you go into a, into a bit of detail about a, a time in your life that, that, you know, looking was a really tough time and that you did have a lot of lessons from? Yeah, absolutely. So it, you know, orish, originated around, so about a couple of years ago, like I said, I was marrying along, I had mindfulness in my back pocket, and I was self-aware, someone who, you know, I've, I've been anxious my entire life. I literally was a little kid, you know, hiding in the room, afraid of bad things happening, um, my twenties were, you know, a panic attack after panic attack. Um, so I, 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 the whole anxiety experience is what I lived. Mm. Um, and then I found mindfulness, you know, obviously I got myself some therapy. I was aware, I knew the patterns, the connections, but I, and I was getting better. It was helping, but it, it didn't help completely. Um, uh, I had been a, a, a health scare or crisis, whatever you call it. Um, I had some pretty scary things happen. I fainted on a couple of occasions. Mm. I had a crazy kind of brain blank thing that happened where I was talking. I literally like could not think. And I went blank in a way that would make sense. I mean, we could all relate to mind goes blank. Oh, I figure out something to say. Yeah. This was a feeling I never had. So, you know, my, my anxiety, um, that I grew up with was very much health based, thinking something bad was kind of simply wrong. So, of course, it sent me into a spiral of, you know, I must have some sort of brain issue now. Yeah. Um, so, I really dove into, I, I mean, that's, that's a brain tumor, brain cancer. It was terrible. So, wow. I dove in and I started to really heal myself on I changed my diet, I changed my lifestyle. I started to heal myself. Um, and that gave me, I think, enough of a body balance that also then started to come to the surface a lot of emotional pieces, emotional truths about my past and my childhood that, you know, I was very defended against, you know, and mm. I had stories of, you know, life being one way and I was finally able to challenge and look at in a deeper way. And it was a pretty dark time for me, um, realizing that on a daily basis, the effects that some of these patterns and experiences were having on me yeah. um, and being honest about it and not doing what I always did, which is diminish it or minimize it or externalize it or you know, pretend it wasn't happening. Um, so that was, again, not only kind of healing my physical self, but I think that gave me, like I said, the foundation to then dive into the, the, the deeper emotional healing that was that was pretty dark. Um, and like I said, a lot of it was having to be brutally honest um, in a way that I think is not pleasant for a lot of us. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And this is a conversation I was having with um, another, another guest just recently, uh, just yesterday, actually. And... Um, what, how were you able to be honest with yourself? What was your method of becoming more honest with yourself? I, I mean, I, I thought of looking and feeling. So triggers are huge teachers, I'll always say. Mm. Um, so obviously daily life, relationships are a huge uh, playground for this. Yeah. They trigger us emotionally. And so what I started to do was realize and when I would see myself entering into that reactivity, um, you know, kind of acting out of myself in a way. That, and I think part of the difficulty is a lot of us know it's kind of like not us when we're feeling triggered or yeah. doesn't feel like us. You know, we'll scream, we'll yell after the fact of like, why the hell did I do that? Yeah. So like, so I have those moments where I start to then see patterns mm. um, in them. So, you know, for me, it was looking at up the patterns and on a daily basis, this would happen. You know, my partner would trigger me or life would trigger me or I'd get caught in this loop of the same thing um, and it was really using those as a jump off point to say okay well well, why might this be what might this have reminded me of or, because my belief is none of this is a coincidence those patterns are there for a reason as is my reaction yes the reaction I'm having today now as an adult right was probably likely the reaction that I've had from every time the similar thing had happened to me in the past. Mm. But of course, when I was younger, my options were much more limited. Yeah. So it's going to look like, again, generalizing one of two major categories. I'm going to do something external and outward. I'm going to scream, I'm going to yell, I'm going to punch things, right? This is like a category some of us fall in. Or it's going to look like a more inward. And this was my favorite. 
I'm going to shut down. I'm going to remove myself. I'm going to put up an emotional wall. Hmm. And again, this originates at a time where those are my only two options, you know, developmentally. But I grew, I changed, I matured. I can now do a million different things. But when that feeling is being touched, I literally revert back because that's the thing that helped at the time. That was my best option. So again, it's looking at those patterns understanding that they are not coincidental, that they come from somewhere, so mm. things that are touching or triggering me have some meaning, as do my reactions, understanding them. Obviously, that then brought some insight into the, my past that, again, I was not telling myself truths about. Yes. But then that also showed me the way forward. Yeah, absolutely. What, um, what are some of the psychologists, psychotherapists, you know, people that have been in the field that have really... um. I guess inspired you and moved you into the the way you are now because there were there were a few kind of psychoanalytical allu, allu, allusions to there and I got really excited there. I was, my, one of my favorites is Carl Jung and I'm not sure if you, you're into Carl Jung, but yeah, I was frothing all that. So <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So I I actually fun fact I did a lot my program a clinical program that I trained in. Um, for my doctor, it was psychodynamically based, meaning it drove into kind of all of those type of models that was our predominant. There's so many different ways, you know, y'all CT, DVT. So ours was kind of really talking about that model, the young model, things like that. But then I also, so we had a little flexibility in terms of choosing where we, where we practice, where yeah. we were training. So I did a lot of work in psychoanalytic institutes. Oh, wow. And Roy, the Youngs and, and the Winnicott's and all of that. So I'm very heavily trenched in that. And I pull from, I, I believe a lot of that to be very accurate and true and give us a lot of information in terms of, you know, our past experience and how it affects us today. Mm. Acknowledging that there's, in my opinion, a very much of a link there. So I pull from a lot of that. I still utilize a lot of that in my work. Um, but now, of course, I'm adding in kind of the evolution while they might not be you know, um, the psychologist, but, you know, kind of understanding the epigenetic model of science and what that, you know, affords us, understanding brain neuroplasticity, Mm. you know, Dr. Joe Dispenza is a huge, you know, kind of person who I I agree a lot with in terms of stories and reprogramming. So again, not necessarily psychological, but starting to, I think, pull from a lot of other avenues and mold that into kind of what what I think treatment needs to look like now. Yeah, definitely. It's so, the holistic approach, again, you know, we keep saying this and um, it's probably why it is your Instagram handle, but it's so accurate as well that, and you know, the a lot of people think that you know, sort of psychoanalytical methodology is is rather dated and all that sort of thing. But it makes so much sense, even from an evolutionary perspective, that when something very alarming happens to us, we you know, our brains are going to hold on to that to try to keep us safe. That's a very, very, I mean, that's that's evolution one hundred and one. You know, it makes perfect sense. Um, and I think I think it's good to have that that foundation, you know, of like you said, CBT and positive psychology and even like an awareness psychology those all of this stuff can help you know if it's a one percent you know one percent one percent that it helps so much more than um than just this is the only way so oh cool you're you're anxious it's only your diet you know mm-hmm. i totally i totally agree and i think it it needs to, and again, part of my intention with all of this is twofold. One is obviously to equip people with the knowledge, you know, that they can use to heal themselves. Like truly believe that it's possible of every human being. Mm. Um, but second is in terms to uh, hopefully evolve the field, right? Because again, I think the field is 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 not where it needs to be, and is not putting out practitioners equipped with the information to really help. And I think one of the, the pivot points again having my own health crisis at the same time, I had already, I accumulated enough hours, years with a lot of the clients, the patients I was working with that I was feeling a lot of their stuffness that we mm. both, you know, me as human, them as human and clinically together got to a certain point and then could not get past that point yeah. because we were operating too much with that old model. So again, I think in terms of a feel overall, there needs to be an evolution because I think that we're not equipping, equipping our practitioners with what they need to, evolve people past these certain points that I think these more traditional models um, stop at. Yes, absolutely. Even even the very simple idea with a patient coming to a GP, for example, and this is by no means an attack on GPs, but you know, saying they have depression and then being, oh, it's a chemical imbalance in your brain, for example. There, there's something so um, 
what the opposite of empowering, you know, disempowering with, with that idea. It's like, oh shit, so there's nothing I can do about it. I'll have to take this for the rest of my life. Great. Even that thought alone with anything in life, not even just, you know, something on the brain makes it very, very difficult to contend with. Absolutely. It's, it's, you said the right word in the word I tell him, and it's very disempowering, but it's based in, I think, a lot of internal beliefs mm. too, and myself included. I was medicated for my anxiety. You know, I told myself that I just had that chip. My mom, I still had anxiety. You know, that's where I got it from. Yeah. That would fix this chip is the medication, you know, that I was on. I had a lot of similar limiting beliefs in terms of my body. My body looked like this because this is my genes. My body could not look like this body. Yeah. You know, I could not develop muscles there, or, you know, I always was going to have this there because that's just what I was dealt with. And mm. I think it is very hugely, and again, of no fault of their own because medical doctors as well, GPs, are not trained in this more holistic model. This is just a global thing, you know, that that is not equipping any of us, I think, with the reality of it. Definitely. Um, and you're right, it means then that there's one problem with one solution, and I have no other choices, but I believe they've actually the complete opposite at this point. Yeah, for sure, yeah. So you were saying before how, um, we didn't actually touch on this, but with the movement that you are creating, where would you like to see this go? Like, what's your, I'm sure you have a vision. Um, you spoke about Joe Dispenza before, I'm sure you do. What's, um, yeah, where can you see this going? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's interesting. Someone asked me the other day, you know, something along the lines of, you know, what, what is the one thing I would want in terms of, you know, to see happen? You know, honestly, it's, it's empowering people. It's mm. that exact message. Just having lived it myself, you know, how incredible it is to truly sit here and believe in my soul of souls that I am capable, you know, of, of pretty much creating the life that I want from mm. the physical health that I want to the emotional wellness that I want. So what I would love to see is just this to continue to be a message that gets out there globally and that if it just continues to touch people, you know, that are ready for it that, and to shift them out of whatever limiting belief or mindset that they have, and to give them control and power and choice, I think that is that that would be you know that would be everything to me. Yeah, yeah, it it, it bloody would be because it's it's about time that people start to take power for themselves. Mm -hmm. Be great. And like I said, I think that I think that the just the growth that the account has had in such a short period of time is really indicative of people being ready. And there's mm. a lot of people out there that are ready to hear this or, or, or if they're not ready or able to hear it. And then, you know, I, I get messages every day with the changes that they're making, you know, the, the changes that they're therefore seeing in their life. And that is just so beyond motivating to me that, you know, that that's what keeps me going and that's what keeps me motivated. And like I said, if I can just keep getting that message out there for the people that are open to it, I think that's, that's amazing. Mm. Yeah. One of my, maybe think, one of my favorite authors was um, a mythologist called uh, Joseph Campbell, and he was influenced heavily by Carl Jung actually as well. And he wrote that the difference between a celebrity and a hero is that a celebrity does everything for himself, but a hero does everything to bring other people up, you know, and create a movement. And um, it's very similar to what you're doing, which is awesome. Nicole, thanks so much for coming on the show. That was awesome. Well, you just completely humbled me by even saying so you've literally made my day. Thank you so much. For that. Listen, I, I want to thank you too, because you are, you know, people like you having me, you know, talking to me, helping me spread this, you know, this get, again, just gets across the years of someone else that of you know, wouldn't have come across my message before that I, I mean, you guys are the reason why this is, this is traveling. So I thank you. Yeah, ab absolutely. No, I love it. We're, um, we could keep going on and on about how much we, who, who, who thanks each other more. <laughs> yeah, right. That's right. great. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Hey, um, where can people hit you up? And now, now's the time to go for a plug. So go for it. Yeah, absolutely. So the best place, the hub that I'm literally at daily. And again, like you could, like I said earlier, you can watch me do some of these things, listen to me tell you how hard it is, but I'm still doing it. <laughs> and that Instagram, uh, the holistic dot psychologist. Um, check me out there. I try to be really responsive in the comments messages. I have a great, amazing, supportive community. A, a lot of individuals who are going through similar struggles, similar journeys, all willing to share and be open. So the dot holistic dot psychologist. Um, I also have a website, which typically is a link in my bio at yourholisticpsychologist.com. Although what might be in my bio now is my new um, YouTube as well. But yeah. Instagram is where I announce everything. So come find me there. 
Beautiful. Awesome. Well, thanks again. And um, that's a wrap.